And I invite you to turn with me now in God's Word to Genesis uh, 28. Genesis 28. <clears throat> and also, if you would um, take out your gray hymnals and turn to page 873 in the back of your hymnals. So I know I'm throwing different, uh, different pages at you and different books even, but I trust that you're capable doing two things at once. Anyway, we've been looking at uh, the catechism throughout the summer in a series, I Belong to Jesus, and um, we're sort of taking the next step today, and we're laying the groundwork for our all-church study this fall as well. Um, we've been talking about faith this last month, our Christian faith. And if, uh, if you do have your hymnals open, um, <clears throat> question and answer 32, say this, why are you called a Christian? And the answer is because by faith, I am a member of Christ, and that's what we've been talking about. Faith connects us to Christ Himself. And then it goes on, and so I share in His anointing. And, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about these, uh, these next weeks. So in September, we're going to be discussing what it means to be um, anointed and, uh, and to take up Christ's anointing, and then... Beginning in October, we're going to actually look at uh, the Ten Commandments and how those things tie together and living out uh, the Ten Commandments as anointed people. So this morning, um, and, and we'll look more at, uh, at Lord's Day 12 in the future, but this morning I want to take you to uh, the account of uh, Jacob's dream, one of his dreams, his dream at Bethel. So that's Genesis uh, 28, beginning with verse 10. And uh, that's page 43 in your Bible. So Genesis is the first book in the Bible. Page 43, chapter 28, verse 10. And I'll begin reading there. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid. And said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So friends in Jesus Christ, we just uh, witnessed two more baptisms uh, this morning, baptisms into Jesus Christ. And for the most part, I think it was, it was pretty subdued. It was almost easy. There was nothing real earth-shattering about it. There was no 
No fire or earthquake like Moses met at the top of Mount Sinai. I didn't see a dove descend like uh, what happened on, on the day Jesus was, was baptized. And so it, it might actually be easy for us to miss the fact that, that two more portholes into heaven were opened today. And it might be easy for the rest of us baptized believers to, to overlook the connection between our own baptisms and, let's say, the, the picnic that you have planned uh, with your friends tomorrow afternoon. Or the connection between your baptism and uh, your labor at the hospital or the factory that consumes your weeks. Or let's just say the connection between our baptisms and all the places we go and all the people that we meet. And so in order for us to begin to make those connections again between baptism and and all that we do in a week, and all the people that we meet. I want to begin by, by just talking about names for a moment. Um, many, many years ago, a child's name was actually assigned when they were baptized, and so on a day like this. And that's where the label Christian name came from. Your Christian name was your, your first name, your given name. Um, Christian names distinguished you from your brothers and sisters, right, from all your your cousins. And then you had surnames or last names to distinguish you from other families. And so baptism and names have gone together for a long time. That's why I always get sort of nervous on baptism Sundays that I'm going to blow the names, right? I'm going to call Harrison Matthias or Matthias Harrison or I'll forget your middle names or it's, you know, it's just things that pastors worry about. Um, nobody else worries about that kind of stuff. But I want to talk to you about one person's name in particular this morning, and that's, that's the name of Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus was a first name, right? Um, but do we really know his last name, his surname? And have you ever thought, perhaps, that actually Jesus' surname was Christ, as if Jesus was born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ? You know, Joseph and Mary Christ, and therefore Jesus Christ. Um, well, if you're honest with yourself, I just don't want you to be embarrassed about that, because most of us at some point in our lives have thought that, that Christ was Jesus' last name. But really, the name Christ isn't, isn't a name at all. It's, it's actually a title. It's a, it's a role, let's say. It's even, a, it's even an office. The word, the word Christ literally means anointed one. Okay? Anointed one. In Hebrew, you would say Messiah or Messiah. Um, the Christ or Christ is the Greek version of that. And both of them mean the anointed one. And it gets a little confusing even in Scripture because in the New Testament, Jesus is often simply referred to as Jesus Christ. But then at other times, he's referred to as Jesus the Christ. Okay? Like in Mark 8, when Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? And then he makes it even more personal and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds that you are the Christ. You are the Christ. That's, you are the anointed one, the one that we have been looking for. And there, it's there that we see this idea of the anointed one. It actually has a history, okay? In fact, in the Old Testament, there were, there were three groups of, of people in particular that were, that were anointed, all right? And it may be better, I guess, to say that there were three official roles or offices that people were actually anointed into, okay? Um, the first office would be the office of, of priest. And you may remember um, the stories of the, the anointing of Aaron, right, in Exodus 29 or Leviticus 8. You might remember that Aaron was Moses' brother, right? And, and when Moses claimed that he was too shy or too tongue-tied to speak to Pharaoh, God appointed Aaron to actually be his mouthpiece, to speak the words of God. And 
and later on, the entire line of, of Aaron, his sons, um, they were set apart to be priests in, in Israel. They were the ones who would fulfill that office of priest. Now, the second office that a person was anointed into is the office of king. And again, we probably remember God's people calling out for a king, right? We want a king, we want a king. And so Samuel uh, was assigned to anoint Saul to be king over Israel. And then later, um, Samuel, that same Samuel, anointed David to take Saul's place. And so you get this idea that the kings as well, that was an office that people were anointed into, all right? And then there were prophets who sometimes actually did the anointing, but, um, but prophets held an office as well. And sometimes in Scripture it seems that that, was, that could be a more informal office, but it was an office. And we do have record of, of someone being anointed into that office. So Elijah was given the task of, of anointing Elisha to be um, a prophet in his place. And so we infer from that that there were other prophets as well who were actually anointed into that office. Now, what, what exactly was going on there when someone was actually anointed? What was that all about? And I just want to tell you, this is more of a teaching sermon, we'll call it this morning, as we're trying to lay the groundwork for what's to come. But what is this anointing all about? What does it mean? Well, when people were anointed into these offices, it set them apart. It set this group of people apart for a very special task. Each of them had a unique role, a unique job. For instance, the priests were the ones who worked in the holy spaces. Okay, So they were the ones who worked in the tabernacle. They were the ones who worked in the temple. Spaces that were designated as spaces of God's actual presence. And priests were then mediators in that space. They represented God to the people, and they represented the people to God, right? And so, if you, let's say, wanted to meet with God, if you wanted to go and confess your sins to Him or express your gratitude to God, you would go into those spaces, but, but you would go to the priests. You would want the priests to mediate on your behalf. You never approached God in those spaces just on, on your own. You always needed that go-between. You always needed that priest. It's, you know, it's sort of like when we were in seventh grade and you had, you had a crush on that one girl in your class, but but you would never go directly to her to tell her something like that, right? She was sort of holy, and she could consume you if things went wrong. And so you went to a go-between, right? You would go to her best friend or something like that and sound her out first. That, that's sort of the role of a priest. A priest was a mediator, all right? Um, so priests mediated the presence of God. Kings had a similar role in Israel. But the king would represent the rule of, of God. The king represented God's justice, God's protection, God's righteousness. And again, um, kings were go-betweens in a sense. If you needed the protection of, of God from, from your enemies, or if, if you were under the thumb of, of usury, um, people charging too much interest, sort of like, you know, check cashing stores today. People get way over their heads and they don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do. You would go to the king seeking justice. Um, the king was supposed to be the hand of God in your life. The king was supposed to take care of you like God himself pledged to take care of you. And so kings represented the rule of God. Now, in, in Scripture, we actually have probably more negative examples of, of kings and the rule of God. But, but kings were, were supposed to fill that office of representing God's rule. And then, of course, there were prophets as well. And the prophets represented God's Word, God's Word to His people, the words of life, okay? Okay. Um, the commands, the covenant, calling people back 
to covenant obedience and also calling God to remember His covenant promises, to not forget those promises that He had made to people. And prophets, therefore, were constantly speaking to us the literal words of God, and yet they weren't people who were removed or distant from God's people. In fact, they were right there among the people. They were right in the marketplace, reminding merchants not to cheat their customers. They were, they were right there with the kings, reminding the kings that they were merely representatives of God. They were not gods themselves. And so the prophets, again, spoke God's word to the people, but they were right there with the people, um, representing the people to God. And so these were the three offices in Israel. And those offices were really a bridge between God and between the people. They were mediators, go-betweens, representatives. As I said, they brought God down and they brought people up. That was the task of the anointed. That's what people were anointed to, okay? That's what being anointed is all about. Now, What's amazing and what I think really helps crystallize that idea for us is that apparently this wasn't only true for people. This was also true of, of places. And, and that's the reason I, I wanted to, uh, to choose this text for today, this, uh, this, this story, this account of Jacob. And I just want us to think about for a moment what happens here. Okay, so Jacob is on the run, if you remember that count. He's running from Esau, his brother. Um, his brother is terribly upset with him, probably wants to kill him. And so Jacob is, is headed off to his uncle Laban's house where he thinks he'll uh, find some safety. Um, Laban's house, however, is outside of the land of Israel, outside of the promised land, I should say. Um, and so Jacob is traveling there, and just before he leaves the promised land itself, he, he stops to sleep. And uh, he finds a comfortable rock to lay his head on, and he lays down to sleep. And obviously these were the days before things like my pillow and comfort foam and, and all of that. And, you know, kids, this is why your parents always remind you when you're going to Camp Calvin or church retreats or whatever, take your pillow with you, otherwise you might end up with a rock. Um, well, Jacob found a nice rock, and he laid down and he went to sleep, and he has a dream. And uh, in that dream, he sees a stairway to heaven. And I shouldn't put it that way. Um, you're just going to think of Led Zeppelin. It's a stairway between heaven and earth, all right? And and on that stairway um, are angels of God, messengers of God. And the messengers are, are ascending and they're descending. They're going up and down um, between heaven and earth. Um, and next, God actually appears. And uh, the text seems to imply that God is at the top of this stairway. We're not entirely certain. Um, and God reaffirms for Jacob the covenant that he made with, with Abraham. And he tells Jacob, he says, I promise you, I'm going to bring you back to this land that you're sleeping on right now. You and your descendants will inherit this land. And then he says that, and God is going to pour out blessings from heaven through Jacob. So in this, this portal, this, this connecting place between heaven and earth, God is basically saying, Jacob, all of the blessings of heaven I'm going to pour out through you to all the peoples of the world, okay? And it's, it's almost as if there's a, there's a hint of, of Eden here, right? Like Eden is the place in Scripture where, where heaven and earth are one, where God and, and human beings are walking together. And it's almost as if God is saying to Jacob here, Jacob, all of the beauty and goodness of Eden... I'm going to pour out from heaven through you to bless all the peoples of, of the world. And, and so God speaks, and what happens? Well, Jacob awakes, 
And, uh, and he says, this place, this place is the house of God. This is, this is Bethel, the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the place where heaven and earth intersect, where they meet. And then, of all things, what does he do? He takes some oil and he pours it on the rock that he's sleeping on, on his pillow. And later that pouring, later in Genesis, God actually refers to as anointing. He says, Jacob anointed this rock with oil. Jacob anointed the place. Not people, but the place. Now, why, why would he do that? And the answer is, because that's what you do to a person or even a place in which heaven and earth come together. You anoint it. Wherever these two things intersect, you anoint it. Okay? Now, let's, let's fast forward from there to this person that we love, Jesus. Jesus, Messiah. Jesus, the Christ. Jesus, the Anointed One. Now, the Catechism says that, that Jesus is called the Anointed One because He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. So, He was anointed with the Holy Spirit, and it says He was anointed to be our chief prophet, okay, our only high priest, and our eternal King. Jesus was anointed to all three of these, these offices. When? When did that happen? When did His anointing take place, do you think? Well, I would say it happened at His baptism. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all the synoptic uh, writers, they all record the account of Jesus' baptism. And in all three, in each one, the baptism always involves water. Okay, Jesus steps into, into the river. In each one, heaven opens. In each one, we hear the voice of God. In each one, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove right upon Jesus. And, and the voice of God says what? It says, this is my Son. This is my Son. Now, Interpreters of Scripture or, or theologians, commentators have told us that that phrase comes right from Psalm 2, which is a royal psalm, and it looks ahead to the Messiah, to the Son of God, the one who will be the King of, of Israel. So you get this kingship there, this is my Son. And then the next phrase is, this is my Son whom I love. And where does that come from? Well, we just studied this not long ago when we looked at the suffering servant of Isaiah, right? And that phrase comes from Isaiah 42. So here, the suffering servant is tied to Jesus as well, the one who, who faithfully speaks the Word of God so completely, so entirely that he suffers as a result of that. And the suffering servant, like we noted in that series, also is is so closely related to God that you could say He's God Himself. And so we get this prophet and we get this priest who actually is the very presence of God within Himself. All three of these things we find in Jesus' baptism. Okay? King, prophet, and priest. Jesus was anointed with water, and with the Holy Spirit at His baptism. And we can't get into this uh, too much this morning, maybe, uh, maybe someday in the future, but the oil, the anointing oil, okay? That oil came to be associated with the presence of the Holy Spirit as well. And so when David was anointed, you might say, the, we also read that in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God came upon him and so you get this combination of, of oil uh, representing the Spirit Himself. And, and so what we have here is we have Jesus, who was a man. Okay, Jesus was of the earth. He was born of a woman. And yet He was also filled with the Holy Spirit of God from above. 
So Jesus was, was this meeting place of heaven and earth in himself. Now, now John is the only gospel writer who really doesn't um, record the event of Jesus' baptism itself. Instead, we simply hear about it sort of secondhand through uh, the words of John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist is talking about Jesus' baptism, he says, I saw the Spirit come down and remain on him. But then John also goes on in his gospel to tell us a story that we don't get in any of the synoptics, but it's the story of the calling of Nathanael as a disciple of Jesus. And Nathanael seems very impressed with Jesus because Jesus knew his name even before he met him. He knew what he was doing. And he calls Jesus rabbi, teacher, prophet. Um, he calls him the son of God, okay? The priest, the presence of God himself. And he calls him the king of Israel. Again, all three offices placed right there. And then Jesus says, you know, he says, Nathaniel, you believe because I, I told you I saw you under the fig tree, but you shall see even greater things than this, he says. I tell you the truth, he goes on. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending, but here not on a stairway, but on the Son of Man. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? He's saying, Nathaniel, remember Jacob, okay? Remember the place that he anointed as the very house of God. Well, now you see the real house of God standing right before you. I am the place where heaven and earth come together. I am the place where God and humans meet. I bring God to you and I bring you to God. And John's gospel is just full of that kind of imagery. Um, Jesus doesn't just bring us the Word, right? He is the Word of God. And Jesus doesn't just intercede for us in the temple, but Jesus is the temple of God. He is the Father's house. He is the place you go to be with God. What this means, friends, is that the, to be anointed, um, <clears throat> Jesus was actually the anointed one who brought heaven to earth. All of the goodness, all of the beauty, all of the grace, mercy, all of the blessing of heaven came to earth through Jesus. And it's when we are united with Jesus that we receive all of those things. That we are united with heaven itself. That's what it means to be the Christ, the anointed one. Now, let me just ask you something before we close. What's your name? What's your name? And I'm not talking your given name. I'm not talking your first name, Harrison, Matthias. I'm not even talking your last name or your middle name. I want to know your real identity. What's your real name? When you were baptized into Jesus Christ, what became your real name? When you were united by faith, with Jesus Christ himself, what did your name change to? By faith, aren't you now called a Christian? A Christian? What does that mean? Well, people who followed Herod were called Herodians, right? People who followed Christ were called Christians. They are Christ people. But when you really look at the word, they are anointed people. They are the people of the anointed one. And we are anointed people ourselves. We are people who are 
anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. And when that happens, we actually become places where heaven and earth are joined. We become portals into heaven. We become mediators of the very presence of God, of His love, of His justice, of His mercy, representatives of God here on the earth. In the marketplace, in the boardroom, in schoolrooms, wherever we go, wherever we are, we are like a portal into heaven. Can I just ask you to remember that? Tomorrow, when you go to your picnics, when you go back to the office on Tuesday, or you're interacting with your children, or you're thinking perhaps your work is meaningless or hard or not making a difference, can you remember that you have been anointed to stand in a very particular place, wherever God has called you, you have been called to be a portal to heaven in that actual place, a portal where God can pour out all of His blessings from heaven to the people that you interact with through your hands, through your labor, through your conversations, the Holy Spirit is present. Can you remember that you've been anointed by Jesus Himself? And you bear the offices of prophet, priest, and king, and that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this series. But let's pray now. Jesus the Christ. We need to remember more often, Jesus, and we need you to remind us <clears throat> that yes, you are the one, the only one who saves us from our sins. You are our brother. You are our friend. You are also the Christ. You are the only one who could unite heaven and earth who could bring us God and bring us to God. You are the only one who could reconcile us with the Father through your death on the cross. Help us to remember that you have made us office bearers as well, that we too have now been anointed with your Spirit to continue on in this world, bringing the presence of heaven to earth and vice versa. Lord, help us to see and realize that we are office bearers, each and every one of us, to take that seriously, to realize in the morning when we wake up that we are going to our office. Our office comes with us, that every interaction is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to bring heaven to earth once again. Fill us, Lord, with your Spirit. Fill us with your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen.